Today, I am chatting with our uh, Jillian, who is our second time guest on the podcast. Uh, Dr. Jillian Mandich is an incredible leader in her community and a happiness doctor. She has spoken m multiple times on TEDx stages, is the resident TV expert for breakfast television and the social, speaking internationally about happiness, how to practice gratitude, and how to lift yourself up and live your happiest life. I invited Jillian back on the podcast today Today because in the midst of this uncertainty and this global pandemic, I think that it is so important to talk about how can we be grounded in a place of certainty within ourselves, you know, mitigate the risk around the conversation around mental health and talk a little bit about happiness. So welcome, Jillian. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, and thank you for having me. You know, I think especially in this unprecedented, uncertain time, now more than ever, it's important to have these conversations and mm. to really, because we're all, like we were chatting before we jumped on here, we're all in this together and really more than ever, we need to not physically, but emotionally and virtually lean on each other. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. So let's start a little bit with the happiness piece. I mean, you are the expert in this and I know you and another doctor were leading like a massive research study on happiness. So what do people need to know, I guess, as a baseline of happiness and then how a big traumatic event like a global pandemic can really impact that in so many ways? Yeah. You know, so uh, one of the things that people ask me a lot when I tell people I'm a happiness doctor is they think that I'm happy all the time. Mm -hmm. And I always really try to emphasize the fact that I'm not happy all the time, nor would I recommend you or any of you listening to be happy all the time. That's really not the goal. And that was something that I was actually surprised to learn about when I got into the research and the science of happiness. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is when we look at, um, at happiness, it's part of life and it's not the be all end all. We actually need highs and lows and challenging times and quiet times. We need the spectrum of human emotion because really that's what makes up the human experience. Yes. And so I think especially when we're in times of pandemic, it's, it's completely normal to not be happy. We're scared, we're afraid, we're anxious, we're uncertain, we're uneasy, whatever feelings you're experiencing, those are part of the human experience as well. And so more than not feeling happy and feeling like you should, like air quotes, should be happy yeah. or feeling like that, it's really important to remember that whatever you're feeling right now, it's, it's perfectly okay. It's normal. You know, I was talking to some of my colleagues at the Canadian Mental Health Association and mm. Right now, many Canadians are feeling more fear and anxiety than they have in a very long time, if ever. Yes. And that's normal. And I think it doesn't change anything. And it's important to really recognize and to know that whatever it is you're feeling right now, feel it because this is real. This is life. Life isn't always butterflies and rainbows. Mm -hmm. um, can we apply some science and some research to practice resilience to help us get through this very challenging time in the best way possible? Absolutely. And is it going to be easy? No, <laughs> it's not. And it's one of those harsh realities of, of life. Yeah. And so now the question so much isn't, you know, how do I feel happy? It's what can I do to practice resilience? What are the tools that I have to do that in addition to feeling fully whatever it is that you're feeling right now? Amazing. So I think resilience is an, an amazing thing to look at. Mm -hmm. And I know that you, when we spoke before, and one of the things that you advocate for is that you are your own pharmacist to okay. create the cocktail of your happiness, right? Yeah. And like you said, you don't need to feel or sh that you should be in this happy state, but I really believe that we can build that resiliency through the practices of self-care, through the practices of maybe having some kind of ritual, adding in movement. So I would love to know your take on what people can do start today and not that it has to have a big to-do list but what are these little things that people can be more aware of that can start building that resiliency to support them yeah um you know and we, we can kind of touch on some of the different key activities but even taking one step back from that i think right now being in this global pandemic there's a lot going on that's out of our control yes there's a lot of things that are happening that no matter how much gratitude we practice or how much exercise we get 
we can't control a lot of what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. And that can be a very paralyzing, anxiety causing, fearful thought. So before sort of thinking about that, one of the things that I think is really important for our mental health right now is to first start asking ourselves, what are the things that we can control? In this situation where I don't feel like I have a lot of power and control, asking yourself, what are the things that I do have control over? And that's the best place to start. That's kind of like, you know, for example, we all can't stop the coronavirus that's going around right now. Hmm. What we can do, we can wash our hands for 20 seconds or more. We can limit our exposure to people that are at high risk. We can stay indoors. These are the things that we can control. Hmm. And by starting to A, bring our awareness to it, and then B, practicing that, that's when we start to take a little bit of our power back. That's when we start to really get a bit more certainty or feel a little bit more certainty in a very uncertain time. And so when we start to think about that, some of the other things that we can control are, like you said, like, are we moving our body every day? It can be very hard, especially in physical isolation. Yes. And, or, you know, physical, uh, this is one other thing that um, I was chatting with a colleague of mine and uh, I was talking about social distancing. And she said, well, it's not so much social distancing, it's physical distancing. Mm -hmm. And so I've been really watching my language around that too, because now more than ever, even though we are physically separate, one of the big, big imperative things is make, maintaining that feeling of connection, that social yes. feeling. Yeah. So that's something every day that we can do. We can reach out on Skype or FaceTime or Zoom or whatever to our loved ones, especially some of the more at-risk people, right? The people yes. that are elderly, the people that are alone right now, focusing on prioritizing and still staying connected because you don't have to be physically together, physically connected to feel connected. Yeah. And let's and, touch on that for one quick mm -hmm. sec, because I think I feel, I know so grateful that I have a family to be with, but a lot of people are isolated by themselves, yeah. which has tremendous impact on, you know, feeling connected to others. And I'm so, I know for me, this is very different than SARS and very different than smallpox even because we have such advanced technology that we can use and have conversations and feel like we're having a coffee across from each other. Yeah. So I, you know, I would love to know, especially because the research that you have have about how we can create communities, these kind of pods in places where we are physically isolated that we can feel socially intimate in communities. Yeah. You know, and I think more than ever, it's, it's so, I love that you asked this question because it's, mm -hmm. it's so critical. It's, it's a key piece. This is really what's going to bring us through this together. 100%. And it's kind of like this paradox, right? Where we are physically isolated and yet as a global community, we're more connected than ever. Right. And so one of the things I think uh, first and foremost is that um, there was a big study out of Harvard that found that the number one predictor of both long-term health and happiness is social connection. Mm. And I think more than ever remembering that, remembering that above our gender, above our socioeconomic status, how much money we make, how many kids that we have, where we work, where we live, above all of that, the number one thing that's going to influence both our happiness and our longevity is, and our health is social connection. And what I mean by that is one or two relationships where you can go confide in somebody and then they also with you, these relationships that have the reciprocity. So it's not one-sided. There's sort of that mutual connection, knowing that you have that in your life above everything that's going on right now. In my opinion, that is the most critical piece. And so we really have to make an effort to nurture that right now. Yeah. And maybe even think about some of those people in our life that might not have that and reaching out to them. Yeah. Because one of the other really beautiful things about that is that um, when you look at the research, doing nice things for other people has a positive impact on you. And not only from just a happiness perspective, but also from like that physical connection uh, perspective. So when we think about those people, especially those less fortunate right, than us right now, people that mm. are you know, in self-isolation because they may have symptoms but need groceries or people that can't get to the store, looking for opportunities right now to connect with people and to, to give back to our community in whatever way we can. And whether that be our time, whether that be our energy, our resources, more than ever, that not only is gonna help somebody else, it's also going to help you. Mm. And I think, 
that that's something that we can all, again, like I talked about, where can, where can I find control? Where can I take power back in the situation? That's something that we all can do. No matter what it is, we all can do something, whether it's phoning somebody, whether anything, uh, it doesn't need to be these big grand things. The small things really are the big things for people, especially when we're feeling lonely and isolated. Yeah, absolutely. So you were a yogi for many years, teaching mm -hmm. movement and breath. I would love to hear your perspective now that you are so well researched in happiness mm -hmm. about how people can, you know, when someone is so anxious, it is very difficult to sit still or to even try to change the conversation that even though they do have control over of saying, you know, I am actually safe. I am okay right now. Yes, there's a lot going on, but I have food. I'm safe. I'm not ill right now. You know, like checking in. How can people shift if they're stuck in that moment that is so overwhelming and overbearing with worrisome, mm -hmm. where can those people start? Yeah, you know, um, so I've been doing a lot of media interviews the past week or so talking about how to curb uh, fear and anxiety right now because it's on the forefront of a lot of our minds, myself included. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things when I was writing my scripts for these shows, more than, more than anybody, I was writing them for myself because I... I'm feeling fear and anxiety just like everybody else for the most part. And so I was really looking into the literature and into the tools to figure out what, what can I do to share with others, but also from a personal perspective. Yeah. And I noticed for myself with anxiety, especially in particular when I would put the news on. So first and foremost, everything else aside, just as a quick sidebar, right now limiting your news consumption is really important for your mental health. Um, so two pieces to that one, you know, we don't want to be looking at the world through rose colored glasses and shutting everything out. The reality is we do need to check in with the news mm -hmm. and we really only need to do it once or twice a day. And it should not be, and I would not recommend it's before bedtime. So check in, get a little bit what you need to know. And then, you know, we really need to create those boundaries with the news because that can spur a lot of the fear and anxiety that we're experiencing right now. And then also when we are getting the news, it's really important now so more than ever to make sure we're getting it from credible places. Yes. Are we getting it from our local health unit, you know, our public health authority, our Canadian government or American or whatever country you're listening to from your actual government or the World Health Organization? Yes, agreed. Reputable places more than ever. It's going to give you a sense of certainty because those are the facts. And a lot of uh, stuff can get spun and different things. So it's really key piece. So anyway, I digress back to um, when we're talking about, you know, fear and anxiety and, and how do we find our breath? One of the things that is very common is we start to spiral. Mm -hmm. So we have one little seed that's planted, whether it's, oh my goodness, I lost my job. How am I going to pay my bills? And then you go, oh my gosh, I'm going to be homeless. And then I'm going to be on street, right? We do these, yes. these spirals and, and that... Anxiety comes from fear in the future when we, when we start to really think about that. And it's a very slippery slope to a very scary place. Mm -hmm. One practice that um, it can be really good is sometimes we just actually need to come back to the moment, right? You talked about the breath earlier. Sometimes that's easier said than done, right? And I mean, I'm a yogi and I still struggle with that sometimes when I'm starting to spiral. So this one practice um, that came from a psychologist that really focuses on stress and anxiety management is called the 333 activity. So the first thing that you do <clears throat> is you just look around wherever you are and in your mind, you can say it a lot if you want, but in your mind is totally fine. Yeah. Look around and label three things that you see. <clears throat> so it doesn't, it doesn't matter what they are, but just look around, identify three things that you see. Then look around and identify three things that you hear. Okay. Look, think for different sounds. And then the third thing is you move three parts of your body. And it can be as small as wiggling your fingers, moving your shoulders, whatever, moving three parts of your body. <clears throat> and one of the things, it sounds like sort of like if you're listening right now, and when I first read it, I was like, really? But what that does is it brings you back into your body and into the uh, present moment. Right. And sometimes when we're in that, we need to follow step by step something seemingly that simple, but can be very difficult to do. Right. And so that activity, very short, very brief, but what it does is it acts like a catalyst to switch our thinking and to bring us back into our body. From there, we can start to build, you know, maybe then we do to go into some breathing exercises. Maybe you call a friend if you're starting to spiral to distract you. Sometimes we need to do those things because especially more than ever, like we are, like you said, we're on high stress. Things yep. are very scary. 
we have, I would be willing to bet every single one, if not all of us, are, have more cortisol in our body surging 100%. through than we normally do. Cortisol, you know, is a very powerful stress hormone. And when that happens, our body is in defense mode. So we might, people, you know, if you're listening, you might notice that you're not thinking as clearly or your memory might not be as good right now or things like that. That's what happens when we're in situations like this. And that's, that's totally a normal physiological response that our body has when we're in, in fearful, uncertain times. And so the things that we can do to help bring us back into our body, uh, those more than ever, it's really important to, to ask ourselves, what are those things for us? And then making sure that we prioritize that even when we don't feel like it. A hundred percent. So I'd love to switch gears just for a quick sec, because I know that a lot of people, a lot of my clients have been saying, you know, I'm feeling really grateful, but they're also feeling guilty, right? Mm -hmm. There is a global pandemic and it is crisis. And there's a lot of negative things that are going on, but some people feel a lot of gratitude around having their time, the time with their kids, mm -hmm. you know, slowing down, mm -hmm. but a lot of guilt, right? Because mm -hmm there is a lot of grief and mourning going around. How do you recommend people, I guess, mitigate the guilt and the stress around that? And how can people feel okay about finding celebration in the little things, right? Mm -hmm. And those little joys that maybe we never noticed because we never had time, we were so go, 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 mm -hmm. about slowing down? Yeah, you know, this is, this is a tricky one because it's, mm -hmm. it's almost like in a lot of ways for a lot of people, we're kind of set up to feel weird right now, whether it's you have time at home to slow down and you're, or you're working harder, like the, we're in this really weird yes. time. And so part of it is that we think in our mind and a lot of times it's subconscious what we think we should be doing and how we think we should be feeling. Mm. And then we create the story around that. So I think that wherever we are and whatever we're going through right now, like I talked about earlier, step one is, is feeling that. And then more than ever right now, like the practice of self-compassion is so important mm -hmm. and, and really getting honest with ourselves and being nice to ourselves. And if we're feeling like, say, for example, you mentioned you know, people that might be feeling feelings of guilt. Like um, I have a friend of mine that's a teacher. And so she's home right now and she's receiving her full pay and is like really excited because she has time to do those things on her list that she hasn't been able to do. Clean her closet, you know, go through the stuff in the basement. And she was like, we were having this conversation. She was saying, you know, I feel really guilty because I know a lot of students in my class that parents are still working and they're working from home and, and I'm over here cleaning my closet. Mm -hmm. And, and we kind of had this conversation around, we all are in different situations right now. And what we need to do is put one step in front of the other and really try to do the best that we can with what we have. And, mm -hmm. and if we're feeling that guilt, then, um, we now more than ever, we have enough stress going on right now. We don't need to keep adding to our own pile and guilt is something that happens within our own head. So 100%. releasing that easier said than done yes. or finding a way to, to maybe do something to, to make you feel less guilty. So for example, she um, was feeling guilty because she had all this time. So then what she did was she called a couple people that she knew that could not go out and went and did some shopping for them and then came home. So she found a way to give back because give back. every time we are feeling those things and we're in our head like that, the best thing to do is put yourself in the place of service of someone else and to I do something that. nice for someone else. Because when we're focused on other people, we're not focused inward on ourselves. and guilt is when we're, we're shining that light right back into us. Yes. So, and, and if you are in a position where you have this opportunity or this, you're feeling this gift of time, then I think that more now, so more than ever, being in a, that in a place of gratitude, right? Yeah. And really soaking that in and, and using that time for yourself to take care of yourself, to, to help put yourself in the position um, to, to really marinate in that for a while. Because we often, especially like you talked about slowing down, right? Yeah. In our life, we're so busy, go, 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 that sometimes when we stop, it can feel so weird, yes. and, right? And we, we're not used to that. That's not our norm. Yeah. And so really settling into that, that new, you know, hopefully very short term normal that we're living in right now um, can be really a powerful thing. And if, if you're really uncomfortable with that, um, you know, maybe this is the time to start journaling mm -hmm. or, or get, getting quiet with yourself. I know for myself, um, my first experience of being kind of alone and with my thoughts was when I got divorced. 
Mm. And it was very weird. Like I remember the first night um, being in, in a bed by myself and I, I felt so uncomfortable mm. being alone. And the only thing that you can do is sit in that and get uncomfortable and get comfortable with being uncomfortable because that, that's growth and that's life. And if we want to, if the goal is to not be comfortable, then, then, you know, you're kind of looking East for a sunset because it's not going to happen. That's just kind of one of those harsh truths of life. You can look at it as harsh, but also it could be a growth opportunity. So our mindset around that stuff right now and how we're choosing to frame and see things more than ever, I think is, is also an important piece of it. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think if you can, if you can just like practice the mindset aspect of it, right. Cause mm-hmm. it is every moment a choice to say, okay, I'm okay right now. You know, can we, can we be a little bit comfortable with this discomfort and mm-hmm. then we'll build the resiliency. Right? Yeah. And you know, sometimes I hear stuff like that and I feel like it's like these platitudes that look really great on Instagram and then you're like, That's okay, true. great, but I'm living my life. Right. Yeah. And, and that's not life. And so I think more than ever, we have to get comfortable with being in the messiness of life sometimes. hundred yeah, percent. And recognizing that sometimes bad things happen. And sometimes when bad things happen, worse things happen. Yeah. And yeah. like I talked about, we can't control those things. All we can really do is control what our response to those yes. things are. And that's where we find our power. That's yeah. where we choose. That's where our choice is. That's where our magic is. And sometimes our choice is having a good cry. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. you know, uh, spending the night on the couch, watching Netflix and eating candy. Yep. Right now, more than ever, we really, that self-compassion that I talked about is more yeah. important than ever. Being kind to ourselves. I know, so I'm, I'm a pretty type A person where originally when this happened, I'm like, okay, I've got this to-do list of items that I never get done. And so this is going to be my opportunity to get these things done. And then I spent last weekend, I didn't even open my computer. And at first I had guilt about it because I felt like I wasn't being productive enough. Mm. And then I realized, okay, first of all, we're all under a lot more stress than we even realize. And right now the goal, you know, for me, well, I first thought that it was going to be, I'm going to be so productive. I really let go of that and I'm taking things day by day. And I feel like in terms of how we're navigating this day by day right now is where we need to be. And if we want to watch a whole bunch of shows on Netflix for the day, you know what? Do it. (laughs) Right. Like releasing the shoulds and the guilt around that piece of our life right now, I think is really important too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. One final thing. So I know you often say that 10% of our happiness is based on genetics, sorry, 10% on life circumstance, 50% on genetics, right? 40% thoughts, action, and behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, life circumstance seems to be taking over in this, Mm -hmm. right? And I feel like the entire quotient of the globe is taking a little bit of a hit with grief, Mm -hmm. mourning, with crisis. So in the midst of that, Mm -hmm. I know you've spoken so much on the science behind gratitude. Mm -hmm. And like we, we touched on controlling our thoughts and our reactions to certain things. Can you touch on a little bit of the science of the gratitude and how we can, you know, insert that little bit when we are looking at our reactions to things that can maybe, even if it's a micrometer of movement towards, you know, more stability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, gratitude more than ever is is a very powerful practice. And there is a plethora of research that really highlights how correlated gratitude and happiness are. Mm -hmm. The thing to remember is it's not, the gratitude is not this panacea where it's like, okay, I think about three things that I'm grateful for. And then my day is happy. Right. It's the small cumulative effects of that, that are the secret sauce of gratitude. Yes. So what gratitude, in my opinion, the way I think about gratitude right now is it's kind of like our life preserver, right? We're all out here, we're, we're treading water, we're trying to, to survive and to navigate this world. And, and it's almost like this raft that we can hold on to. It's not taking away our situation. It's not really changing anything other than it's easing it a little bit for us. Mm-hmm. And, and that right now is a pretty amazing gift. So when we think about gratitude, um, some, some sort of tips if you're listening right now, if you wanna kind of really amplify the practice. Uh, number one, is if you're wondering, what do I need to ask myself I'm grateful for? The question of gratitude doesn't really matter. When we look into the literature, if you're asking yourself three 
things you're grateful for that you learned today or three people that you're grateful for in your life, three body parts that you have, three things that you've learned on this podcast, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, the question of what you're grateful for doesn't matter. It's the act of looking. Okay. Um, the other thing, especially in times like this, or even when I do talks, I'll have like an Eeyore in the room, put up their hand and they'll say, you know, Jillian, there, I have nothing in my life to be grateful for. And I think now more than ever, there's a lot of people that are really feeling that. 100%. Yeah. And, and what is really important to remember if you're feeling that, or if you know somebody that is, when we're looking for gratitude, the outcome isn't really that important. It's the act of searching. Right. Okay. So if you are not feeling like you have anything grateful for in your life, even just looking and thinking about it has powerful effects on your mental health. Mm. So taking the time, and if you're really, you know, really searching, you're breathing right now, right? There's things that we can really try. And, and it's not so much the outcome, it's the process. It's the same with happiness, right? It's not a destination, it's the practice. The magic is in the doing. Yes. Same thing with gratitude. Getting as descriptive as you can when you're thinking about those things that you're grateful for. And usually three is a good number. In my PhD, um, the activity that I had research participants do in in a happiness uh, boosting intervention was every day it was three great things that they had to write down. And in a good, better, best situation, writing it down, best case scenario, and even just thinking about it, still a very very powerful practice. The other thing is, is mixing it up. So asking different questions. So instead of if every day you write down who are three people that I'm grateful for Mm. every single day, then what you really want to do is mix it up, ask different questions, different things you're grateful for. And then my last tip, and this is something I've been, I I did an interview yesterday and they were asking me about my gratitude practice. And one of the things that I've been doing lately is almost taking it one step further. And I think we had really touched on social connection earlier Mm-hmm. And, and the power of that sometimes, like, for example, if it's three people that you're grateful for in your life and you write them down in your journal, that's great. And it's, it's wonderful. Um, and if you took it one step further, you could let them know. Yes. And I think we kind of had talked about, you know, the, how important it is really reaching out, even if it's like reaching out and telling someone, you know, um, you said something to me once that has really struck with me and it's really doing that, taking our gratitude and sharing it with mm-hmm. somebody else, I think more than ever can really help to amplify what's going on. And like I talked about earlier, we're in the situation where we don't feel like we have a lot of power and control. Yes. And one of the things that we can do is know that when we do that, and when we share that, we are controlling uh, our behaviors and we're touching the life of somebody else and helping to impact them in a positive way. And I think now more than ever, we all need that. And we think about, you know, being the change that we wish to see in the world. What's really cool about that is when you reach out and do that, you feel good the person on the other end feels good and you never know the chain reaction where they might then reach out to somebody else and do that. And so when we think about the things that we can do to have an impact right now, that is one that regardless of geography, regardless of, of income or anything like that, we all have the opportunity to do that and to, to practice that. And I think it's a good model for us to try right now. Yeah. Yeah. I love that so much. So I will post all the details below how you can follow Jillian throughout this time so that you can get more tips and tricks as we go along. Thank you, Jillian, for your time. I appreciate what you do, not only on this level, but the research that you're doing to just increase the understanding of how people can mitigate mental health issues and try to insert more happiness or practices to guide Mm -hmm. us through the journey of getting there. Thank you. And one last thing that I just wanted to mention real quick. Um, uh, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of parents listening or people that are involved with kids. And I think this is a really tricky time. We were even talking earlier, right? When you jumped on, you're like, oh, I guess I'm homeschooling, homeschooling. now. <laughs> this is something that um, I've been asked a lot about lately. And it's, it's very unprecedented. If you're working at home and your kids are there, or, or how do you talk to your kids about what's going on? How do you tell them they can't go see their friends or their grandparents? Wow. Wow. Um, and so uh, one resource I really wanted to highlight. So I do work part-time at Sick Kids, mm-hmm. um, the Children's Hospital in Toronto. And um, we've actually built out a big piece of the website with resources for parents. Oh, that's amazing. We had talked about earlier how important it is to get our information from credible evidence-based sites right now. Mm-hmm. Um, this site Everything on it has been vetted by doctors, nurses, dietitians, researchers from all 13 of Canada's children's hospitals. So every piece of information on this site 
is trusted, it's evidence-based. So as a parent, if you're looking to kind of navigate through the through everything and find out like what are some key resources that we feel are really good um, for pediatric focus for parents, families, caregivers. Um, it's a great, it's a great tool. So, and it's all completely free. If you go to meant to prevent.ca, so it's M E A N T and then the number two and then yep. prevent P R E V E N T. There's you right on the page There's a big banner right at the top that takes you to a bunch of different resources for how to talk to your kids, how to manage stress and anxiety with your kids, things like that. It's a great tool. Amazing. And then one last thing to remember, if you are a parent, uh, kids are like sponges. And right now they're watching you more than you even realize, especially because they're in close proximity. Mm -hmm. So the way that we act and the way that we are is modeling that for our kids. So really trying to focus on our mental health, because not only is that important for us, it's really important for our kids and anyone else that we, um, that we come in contact to now more than ever. Yeah. So, yeah. Will you give us a quick tip? Because one of the things, I mean, I'm a mom at home that's trying to run mm -hmm. my business, do my podcast and now mm -hmm. trying to homeschool. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that I know people are really struggling with is finding the time to practice self-care for themselves. Mm -hmm. How do you think, recommend that people, I mean, outside of letting their kids use some time to get the information off of sick kids website, for example, mm -hmm. how do people insert that, that in so that they can get a little bit of that self fuel back for themselves? Yeah. I, you know, I was actually having a really interesting conversation with a, a with a colleague of mine at sick kids yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, because as, as parents or as anybody that, um, is involved in the lives of children, screen time is a really big issue. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, okay, but my kids are at home all day. Like, what am I supposed to do? Keep them off screens all the time. And like you said, I have a friend that's like, I wanted to have a shower <laughs> and it's full <laughs> on from when you wake up to when you're not. So if I don't give my daughter who's 10 an iPad, will I go in the shower? Like, and so there's this kind of this, the programming and, and what all the research talks about is, you know, screen time, we really need to limit and restrict screen time. But mm. now when you have a kid that's home with you all day, every day, what do you do? Um, so number one, right now, guilt out the window, yes. you know, like I talked about before, you're doing the best that you can with what you have in these situations. And like, we're surviving. And right now, anything that is that is a win, in my opinion. Um, and then the other thing is I think sometimes self-care, even in like the world before this pandemic can become an item on a to-do list, mm -hmm. right? It was for me, you know, like, okay, go for a bath. And then I'm in the bath and my mind's racing. And then I get out and after five minutes, I'm like, oh, okay, I did that. Or I went for a massage, check. Right. Now, so more than ever, recognizing that when we can take care of ourselves, whether it be taking a little bit of time for ourselves, that's amazing. Um, but really to me right now, self-care is caring for our mind and the thoughts that we have for ourselves and what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. And when we have opportunities to have a little bit of quiet, or if you want to put on, you know, um, actually another great resource, Ted Ed, um, has amazing resources right now that they put up online for parents for like online learning and stuff. Yes. So it's all Ted Ed. Um, so, you know, maybe you want to find a video, put it on for them and go sip tea in the other room, like go for it. Yes. Agreed. Now more than ever, releasing the guilt and doing those things when we can, looking for opportunities to do that. Um, and then I think remembering that when we connect with each other, that's the best thing that we can do. And truly yeah. self-care right now is not just care for us, but it's ourselves caring for other people. Most of the time that's going to be virtually right now. Um, yeah. That's a big thing. And then the other, the other piece, I think there are so many, especially frontline healthcare workers right now that are, working really long hours, um, that are putting their health, you know, they're risking mm -hmm. that to help other people. So something else that can be really great is thinking about how can we support those people or even people that still have to go to their job, people that are in a position where they do need to go to work. How can we help to self care for them too? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I think that's more than ever. Um, I saw a friend of mine made cards. They, they made like little virtual cards for, um, for people at the hospital. I thought that was really cute. Oh, that is really cute. So looking for ways to get creative with your kids and doing those things, I think is a really, um, is a, is a good thing to start thinking about. And when we, again, start putting ourselves in the position of thinking of other people, that's one of the most powerful things that we can do right now while we're in survival mode to help us 
get through this in yeah. the most resilient way possible because there's really no best way to get through this. Nope. Right? We're, we're in survival mode and, and that's reality. Yeah. And so what do we do? How do we navigate this in a way that we can with the tools that we have in our tool belt? And even, you know, I celebrate you for listening right now mm -hmm. and taking the time in all of this to, to have these conversations because yeah. I think especially in times like this, it's more important than ever. I completely agree. And on that note, thank you so much for joining us. Thank I appreciate you. you. Stay safe, stay healthy, my friend. You too. Thank you. Thank Bye you. Perfect. Yay. It goes by so fast.